Hello, everyone. We will get started in just a moment. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's Lunch and Learn, supporting climate education in Maine schools. Climate science education is part of the Next Generation Science Standards, and it's a key recommendation of Maine's Climate Action Plan. It's also essential to preparing Maine students to respond to the climate crisis, evaluate solutions, enhance community resilience, and enter the growing clean energy workforce. But Maine teachers need support to deepen climate education, and that's where LD 1902 comes in. It will fund climate education professional development for teachers and partnerships between schools and community organizations. This bill is a priority of Maine's Environmental Priorities Coalition, and we are thrilled to have representatives from two EPC member organizations with us today. On your right is the Grassroots Climate Action Organizer with Sierra Club Maine. She also serves as the youth representative to the Maine Climate Council. And Javen Santos is policy manager at the Climate Initiative. They are joined also by Susan Krauss, who's an eighth grade teacher in Falmouth. Thank you to all three of you for joining us today. My name is Kathleen Neal. I am the Director of Policy and Partnerships here at Maine Conservation Voters, Maine Conservation Alliance. Our organizations represent more than 13,000 members and supporters dedicated to protecting Maine's environment and our democracy. MCA does that through education, collaboration, and advocacy, and MCV by influencing public policy, holding politicians accountable, and winning elections. A few technical notes for today. We will hear from all of our speakers and then tackle questions in the Q&A session at the end. You don't have to wait though, you can send your questions to me through the chat whenever they occur to you and I'll keep track of them for the, the Q&A at the end. If you have any technical difficulties today, you can message Will Sedlak and he will help you out. This event is being recorded and we will share that link out later this afternoon We'll also post it on our website where you can find recordings of all of our previous Lunch and Learns. Thanks again for joining us. And Anya, I will turn things over to you to kick things off. Thanks so much, Kathleen. Um, good to see you all. Um, I'm gonna start by sharing um, some slides. Um, so yeah, thanks so much, uh, Kathleen, for introducing us. Um, and uh, yeah, big thanks to, to MCV for hosting us uh, this afternoon. Um, just wanted to start out with a quick question for all of you. Um, and Will, if you wouldn't mind opening up the chat so that folks um, can share their answers to this question in the chat. Um, but we're curious what climate change education did you all uh, receive in school? Um, whether that be, you know, extensive climate change education um, or none at all. Uh, we're curious to hear uh, what, what, people, what people's experiences have been. All right, seeing none, none, none. <laughs> A lot of none. Did it, has anyone here received any climate change education? Some, okay. None, okay. Yeah, so um, I'm uh, just about to turn 25, graduated high school in 2015. Um, and, oh, thanks Luke, received very little. Um, and um, yeah, received some climate change education in, in, in middle school, but um, you know, really didn't get um, to dive into climate change education until college. Um, and when we were you know, working on writing this bill, that's something that we heard really across the state. 
um, is that, uh, you know, no matter people's ages, climate change education was not a large part of their K through 12 education. Um, and we're really seeing a need in order to prepare, you know, the future generations for the, car the climate crisis that we face, um, really seeing a need to expand climate change education in, in Maine schools. Um, which brings us to um, the climate change education bill. Um, so moving on, I'm just gonna touch on the urgency of this bill. Um, so um, this putting together this bill um, started uh, many years ago um, with the Nature-Based Education Consortium Climate Change Education uh, Policy <laughs> Working Group. It's a bit of a mouthful. Um, but these five points are really um, the main points that we found um, from, from all sorts of people across the state um, in why we need this bill. So first off, um, we heard from teachers across the state that they really need um, our support uh, when teaching climate change education, um, whether that be professional development um, or, um, you know, support um, in getting materials, et cetera. Um, and we're lucky enough to have Susan Cross with us here today. And I know she'll be sharing her teacher's perspective later on in the presentation. Um, we also saw a need for equitable access to federal funds. Um, so yeah, climate change education funds from the federal level need a place to go um, in the state. Um, saw a need for workforce development uh, with the you know, major changes happening, happening in our work, workforce with um, you know, the great new green economy and climate energy jobs, seeing a need for um, making sure our young people are prepared for that. Um, we also saw a need from teachers to support um, or a need for support to fulfill educational requirements. So there is some climate change education in the current next generation science standards. Um, but we are hearing from teachers across the state that they have not um, had the support that they need in order to, to truly um, incorporate that into their curriculum. Um, and finally, um, the Maine Won't Wait plan in its strategies uh, recommends um, action on climate education now. And so this bill is a big part of um, moving forward uh, those goals as well. Um, so with that, I'll pass it over to Javen. Um, to talk about the goals of the bill. Thanks, Anya. Um, so the goals of this bill, which is LD1902, if you all were interested in looking it up yourself, the title of the bill is Resolved to Establish a Pilot Program to Encourage Climate Education in Maine Public Schools. Basically, this bill establishes the Climate Education Professional Development Pilot Program for three years, and that a uh, professional development pilot program will provide professional developments for teachers through providing grant funding. And through that grant funding, teachers across different disciplines, uh, different subjects that they teach, will be able to incorporate climate education from the trainings that they receive. This bill through the grant program also allows schools and community organizations within Maine to partner together to create um, these trainings and to uh, fund the, to provide funding for community organizations and community experts to cooperate with the schools. So those are the, the main goals of the bill. Um, and in order for us to hear from someone who has uh, experience in this type of field, we've brought Susan Cross to talk a little bit about the teacher's perspective on this bill. Oh, uh, Susan, I think you're muted. You gotcha. Are we there? Are you hearing me? Yeah, we are indeed. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> 
the gray hair is challenged sometimes on these things. The uh, I, I just wanted to clarify that I am not currently a full-time teacher. I retired a couple of years ago and went from teaching eighth grade for 25 years in middle school to now subbing in the elementary school, which has been a challenge in itself. Um, the So I taught 25 years in social studies. I actually did develop a interdisciplinary program on climate change with our science department. So I feel like I've had a little bit of background on, on the challenges of doing that without a lot of support from outside. But prior to being a teacher, I was an environmental economist in the private sector, and my uh, graduate degree was in resource economics. So I came into doing this with a little bit of background, and yet the challenges that faced us putting together a program um, takes an enormous amount of time for teachers. So I wanted to just address uh, four points. First, what, on the issue of the topic itself of climate change and why teachers need to be ready is because kids are aware, whether they're elementary students, middle school students, high school, the issue of climate change is very much in focus for them. I, I was just noting that within the last 24 hours, I have heard two major things about climate change and how it's impacted. One was a radio program on Franklin County and how the changes in snow amounts have impacted the economics of places like Rangeley. The kids who live in those towns are aware of that. The, um, so if you have children asking questions, you need to be ready to help them find the resources and understand what's going on and what their role is in it. Secondly, for the teachers to be prepared. Teachers need to learn. We are lifelong learners. I noticed the majority of people over a certain age said they had not had education on climate change. Um, first of all, they, they had elements of it. It was called something else. And we didn't see the impact of, of where it was going. Children today have often, uh, in most of the schools around here, do something for Earth Day which is an element for them to be aware of. But teachers need to learn. You don't want to give misinformation. You want to give the correct information. Uh, they need to address the student's interests. And really, I feel like this is a topic that is one of the most important interdisciplinary topics that we can be talking about. Because if we're giving the students the information, they also want to know what they can be doing. Um, and they're aware that this is be very much being led by young people. Um, the issue of why this bill is important for teachers, and that has to do with time for teachers. Developing curriculum takes an enormous amount of time. And you want to have, I, one of the things I like in this bill is the use of outside experts. People, their main is full of people who know a lot about the environment and changes. And to use those people is going to make it so much easier for teachers uh, as programs get developed. So I think that that's really important. Um, the one of the things that's great from a teacher's perspective is this is a topic that kids are so enormously interested in. Certainly, it, that was my experience in the middle school level. And they, they took on very active roles as we developed the program, both from uh, the topic itself and from the interdisciplinary. What's important to understand is we shouldn't have teachers individually shouldn't have to reinvent the wheel every time we're looking at a new part of the curriculum and that's that's the importance of how this bill supports teachers so there we are thank you and i think javen we're back to you uh 
All right. So now with any policy, of course, they come with a lot of questions. So we're just going to go, I'm just going to go through some of these common questions that we've had asked as we've been working on this bill. The first question that comes up often is, is this bill a top-down mandate? The answer to that question is no. This bill does not mandate climate education, rather it creates a grant program to fund professional development for curriculums uh, that have already been decided. So no, this is not a mandate. And, um, and yeah, another question that we've asked, that we've been asked throughout this process is, can this money be used for better purposes? So in the language of this bill, this bill is actually drawing the funding for this bill and the general fund, meaning that there is no other education funding that this bill is taking away from. That's the goal of the bill is to provide, is to pull more funding to create these professional development programs to help teachers. Another question that has been asked to us is how is this bill equitable. To that, we would say that equity is the priority in shaping the bill. Uh, in the language of LD1902, it prioritizes schools currently underserved by climate science education. So the hope is that through these professional development programs, those, these grants and this funding will go towards those communities that need these climate science educations. Are there any groups that don't want this to pass? The, the thing about this bill is that many main specific teachers organizations have come out in positive support of this bill, such as the Maine Science Teachers Association, the Maine Association of School Nurses, Maine Environmental Education o uh, Association, and several other main organizations have come out to support this bill. Is this bill based on teachers' needs? The answer to that is that throughout the creation of this bill, the bill was driven by teachers, students, and organizational partners. So teachers have expressed in the 2019 Maine Census of Needs that climate education development is one of their top needs. Thanks so much, Javen. And thanks so much, Susan, too, for sharing your uh, perspective as a teacher. Um, that wraps up some of the overview of the bill itself. And now I'll pass it over to Kathleen to talk a bit about um, the call to action with this bill. Thank you all so much. That's a really great place to, to start and, and get into uh, what we what we can do to help support this bill. Uh, as, as we mentioned at the very top, LD1902 is a priority of Maine's Environmental Priorities Coalition. So one of the things we'll include in that follow-up email later this afternoon is a link to the fact sheet that we've developed for LD1902 and ask you to share it out, read it, ask us if there are questions and, and share it with everybody you can think of. Uh, we're also going to dig in, I've got some great questions here about uh, the process that this that you all went through in developing this bill, and I know that the the nature based education consortium has been a, has played a really key role. Uh, Nevik has pulled together a whole bunch of resources and have has explainers on how to write a letter to the editor. Here's how you contact your lawmakers. Here's how you contact the appropriations committee specifically. Uh, we're going to send a link to the Nature Based Education Consortium so that you can really explore all of those resources. And we're going to answer some questions today. So we mentioned I mentioned the Nature Based Education Consortium. Could, could you all say a little bit more about that consortium and about uh, the Maine Environmental Education Association? I, I, what can I say? I love hearing the stories of, of where bill ideas come from and how they, they go from a, an idea maybe 
folks are, are batting around around the ta dinner table to, to actual legislation. And so I'd love to hear some of that. Sure, yeah. Um, Javen, I'm happy to start with this one and then if you wanna add anything else on. Okay. Um, yeah, and I'm also noticing that uh, Emily Wyrack is here uh, in the audience um, and they're the communications person for uh, the DH Face Education Consortium. So Emily, if I miss anything, please let me know. Um, but yeah, uh, the Nature Based Education Consortium is um, a main based collaborative network of um, outdoor learning leaders and stakeholders working together on um, system le level efforts to ensure that every Maine youth has access to powerful outdoor learning experiences. Um, and so uh, Javen and I and Susan are all involved with the um, climate change education policy working group of the Nature-Based Education Consortium, um, which is a working group that's been meeting for a couple years, um, made up of, you know, multiple organizations. I represent Sierra Club, um, you know, Javen represents uh, the Climate Initiative. Um, there's a list of all of the, uh, you know, involved organizations on the website. Um, but, uh, yeah, that, that group has been meeting for a couple years to um, spark more discussions um, and organizations around climate change education policy um, and uh, partnered with um, the Maine Environmental Education Association um, this summer in June as they hosted their first climate education uh, summit um, uh, virtually. And uh, we um, helped to organize a climate education policy track within that conference. Um, and within that conference, um, you know, got, got the chance to work with students, educators, um, community organizations, um, uh, state officials, and, and other folks interested in climate education policy um, to really gather ideas about this bill um, and to make sure that it was um, you know, number one, what teachers need, also what students need, um, and something that really needs or meets the the, the scale of um, what we're up against um, and does it in an equitable way. Um, yeah, Jamie, did I miss anything on what the Nature Based Education Consortium is? Thank you. I, I love that little window into how um, how we got where we are in terms of identifying the need and proposing the solutions. I know uh, as part of the Environmental Priorities Coalition, that made a big difference to us in hearing that that, that was this is a, a bill that already has significant stakeholder involvement, as we like to say. Uh, also really appreciate Susan you pointing out that they, we're not telling kids anything they don't know right they're they're bombarded with news about the climate crisis and they're they're interested they're invested and in many cases they're they're anxious and they're unsure about what their their place is in in the crisis and in the response feels like a lot for teachers to navigate. And thank you, thank you very much. Uh, what kinds of, of supports do you think teachers need both to, to get the information together, but then also to help kids navigate the, the politics, quite honestly, and the, the psychology of where we are? Um, just a simple, simple question, I'm sure. <laughs> I think that the challenge is to give the students the information uh, rather than talking about navigating the politics. You, you have to, particularly by the time you get to middle school, students are thinking. I mean, not that little people don't think, they do. Um, but, uh, and, and I think I, I noticed a couple of people made comments that when on the question at the beginning about uh, had they had any uh, education in climate change. And a number of people observed the fact that it just wasn't called climate change. We, we did have things. You know, I mentioned the fact that students for a long time have been doing Earth Day. I know my, my children uh, on Earth Day, they were always out 
uh, and becoming very aware. Uh, our students are aware of so many things. Just think about the ticks that are around now that they have to check. They have to check their dog. They have to check themselves when they come in. This is something that, uh, you know, 25 years ago, we weren't doing as a routine coming. So there are so they are getting this in so many different ways. I think the challenge is to, to give them information, let them know what their options are. There's lots of things to read. Ah, somebody mentioned, oh yes, the brown tail moth, which don't we love. <laughs> I can't get my meal in the spring anymore. <laughs> the um, and so we we need to give them the tools. I don't think I, I think certainly by middle school and high school, we give them the tools they've got to navigate. If we're giving them the right information, it's not about politics. It's about the issue. It's in, in, in the terms of science, the science is there. I think that's important. Thank you. Thank you. And I wholeheartedly agree and also wonder if if everyone does right and so are i'm wondering if in the the advocacy work that that you all have been doing around this bill are you hearing objections from climate deniers is that something that the teachers need to be supported so that they don't i mean i i can remember sitting in a parent meeting when my, one of my kids was in first grade of somebody saying how dare you teach our kids this stuff it's like oh my gosh wow uh, that's not a i don't want any teacher to be in that position particularly when we're when we're trying to pull together the resources you need have you heard those those concerns or or we're I, mean, I think cross I that I, yeah I happy to happy to take that um yeah i mean certainly i think when we're hearing from teachers especially around the next generation science standards um you know the the curriculums that are already um mandated by the state um and again this would not be a mandate but just support but um what we're hearing from teachers that even that the next generation science science standards they've had difficulty um with um with you know, feeling confident about teaching it in class, especially if they um, teach in um, you know more conservative areas, um, that that's definitely a concern. Um, and I think especially since um, you know climate change has been so politicized, unfortunately, um, that's certainly a concern. And I I think um, so that that's definitely a part of that's been a part of the conversation. And I think in part why um supporting professional development is so important so that you know we're giving not only the students the tools but also the teachers the tools to um be able to feel confident in um in what they're teaching um and then i think also in terms of the main specific um you know climate change uh stuff <laughs> um the main won't wait plan is is so science driven and based in um in science and i think um you know, my, my hope is, is that that additional support um, that is so main specific uh, will be helpful to teachers as well, um, being able to really back up what they're teaching in the, in the, in the science, um, because we have that, that data available. Um, yeah, and Susan, I don't know if you have any, or Javen, go ahead too. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add that, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Anya, because I know you had submitted testimony, but at least on this bill, there was almost 100 people who submitted testimony and several uh, several more who submitted written testimony and it was overwhelmingly in support. So I think at least with this bill, it's we haven't heard as much of those, um, those climate deniers, but I think that's just because there's been a really great educational campaign to understand that this bill is not putting any mandates. This bill is only supporting what's already in place. That is really reassuring and a good reminder that that you know we've got to look at each 
each new step forward as a new new beginning and not carry our, our baggage from the previous fights into it. So thank you. I will uh, I'll, I'll note that. And I am really just so grateful. You know, one of the things that I have heard as a potential obstacle to enacting LD 1902 is the fiscal note. Uh, there is a, a $3 million fiscal note, which, which means that's the, the best estimate of what it will cost to implement this, this bill. Uh, tell us what that, go, that, that $3 million would go to. Uh, and if there are opportunities, one of, one of our participants said, gosh, this seems like a great opportunity for foundation funding or, or corporate funding. And I know that's been some, there's been some discussion around that in the legislature. So tell us, tell us about the money part of this. Yeah, appreciate that question. Um, yeah, so as Kathleen said, um, the $3 million note uh, is, you know, uh, an amount that the working group came up with as you know an appropriate amount of funding for this program. Um, and I think Javen mentioned it um, in his part of the presentation, but the, the money will be split up um, between three years, a million dollars each year put towards the program. Um, and the money will go towards supporting you know professional development for teachers um, and also supporting um, the Department of Education to um, hire a position to make sure that the funding goes out equitably. Um, and um, yeah, that that support with with community organizations is is um, equitable as well. Um, and um, Javen mentioned it too, but so the um, proposal is to draw $3 million from the general fund. Um, and so in terms of, you know, could it be used for a better purpose in the education space? Um, there aren't, you know, alternative education use for these dollars. It's not taking away from the current, you know, education budget. Um, so um, it would be adding to them. Um, and, you know, like we've been saying throughout, um, um, you know, funding, having, having a funded opportunity has been um, it's been made clear to us that that's a real priority, um, especially from teachers um, who, you know, are so overwhelmed right now between um, COVID uh, restrictions, COVID, the, the pandemic um, in general, um, uh, you know, um, tense conversations around, you know, critical race theory. And there's, there's a lot going on in schools right now. And teachers have always had a lot riding on them, but, you know, especially now. Um, and so really what we heard again and again from teachers that was that in order to make this possible, they really need, um, you know, funding support um, for, for their professional development in this area, um, or else um, it, it won't, won't happen fully. And Jamin, I'm not sure if you want to add anything else to that, but. Yeah, um, I think in terms of talking about the the fiscal note, it is a significant barrier, but at least in terms of the process of this particular bill, what we have to acknowledge that the process would be that the that the legislature would vote on the bill as a concept first. Um, once the bill is voted on as a concept, then later on in the session, um, that's when the funding will be the fiscal note will be discussed more and that's when uh, we will be able to get a better understanding of how much funding is available for this program. So at least now the priority for us in terms of this bill is to get it passed by the legislature as a concept first. And as we move down the line, it'll be important for us to do outreach to the appropriations committee once we get to that point. Thanks, Javen and, and Anya, and, and just the, the status update, I should have said this at the beginning, that the bill has been voted out of committee. So a majority of the members of the education committee said, yes, we love this, let's move forward. So now it will go to the full legislature and, and lawmakers will have an opportunity to say, yep, love this. And, and once they do, right, we're, we're 
manifesting this, that it will go to what we call the appropriations table. Uh, and so that's just a, a means it sits there until they've done all the other work of the session. And then they look at, at the all the bills that require funding to implement and figure out, do we have enough? Do, does everything get what it asked for? Do we have to, to reduce the amount of funding over here? And one option that the appropriations committee has at that point is to say, we're not going to fund this one. So that's why we've got sort of a, a two-step advocacy process where first we want to talk to lawmakers about, yes, support this. And then we want to talk specifically to the appropriations committee about funding it. Um, so so thanks for bearing with us through all of those, those steps and, and the, the process. Uh, but to go back to that idea about other sources of funding, if whether to supplement the, the what the appropriations committee comes up with or, or to supplant it, will private funds be an option or is there something, is there a restriction there? Um, yes, thank you for the question. That definitely was a part of the process when it was discussed in committee. So in committee, the bill was pushed out with an amendment that says that there are no private funds that can be used to support this program. So it'll be all public funding, at least at this current stage where the language is written. And I think I'm going to guess here that that there are some folks who say, well, gosh, what a missed opportunity, right? There are so many uh, really powerful advocacy organizations that, that may be able to, to weigh in here. What's the logic behind that amendment? Yeah, um, yeah, Kathleen, you're right. And I think it's it's it is kind of a, a mixed bag. I think um, you know, on the other hand, though there are a lot of great organizations in Maine working on this, um, there's also the risk that you know fossil fuel companies could come in and um, try and influence what the um, professional development looks like for teachers. Um, and so I think the the intention of it was to um, make sure that the you know overall intention of the bill was protected. Um, Jay, I'm not sure if you want to add anything else to that too. That makes a lot of sense. That, that does make a lot of sense. Um, and it, it, we obviously want our professional development to, to flow from national science standards from the climate action plan and not from a, a particular agenda, if you will. Uh, what kind of, of professional development does the does the bill imagine? And then I'm I'm also really curious about what you said, Anya, about uh, making sure that it's it happens equitably across the state. So I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, could you say your first question one more time? Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I have a bad habit of, no, of no, you're good. questions at the same time. <laughs> so let's go, let's go to the equity one and then talk about on um, the kind of professional development that would be most, most helpful. Yeah, yeah. So um, in terms of equity, um, you know, this was definitely a, a large um, consideration in the whole process of of creating um, this bill. And I mean, you know, just starting from the beginning, um, you know, going back to the working group that um, put the bill together, uh, the Climate Education Policy Working Group is an intergenerational working group um, uh, made up of youth educators um, and other, other organizations and folks that are um, affecting or being affected by um, you know, climate education. Um, and so um, kind of from the beginning, equity has been a big part of the process, um, both, you know, internally uh, as the bill has been shaped and then externally as um, it's being, it was being written. Um, but so it is written in the, um, in the uh, bill that the, that LD1902 will prioritize schools currently underserved by climate science education. 
Um, so for example, you know, I went to high school um, in Falmouth uh, in the school district that um, Susan taught in. And you know, I had I had decent access to climate education compared to the rest of the state. Um, and so, you know, a town like Falmouth that um, already has some of those programs might um, not be uh, considered for support, whereas um, a, you know, another town with with absolutely no climate change education would be prioritized. Um, and then also, um, so Maine has a rich, you know, landscape of supportive community organizations that um, are already partnering with some schools to provide, you know, the capacity that schools lack right now. Um, so, um, you know, that's another component of, you know, even if a school is over capacity and um, doesn't have the staff support or, um, you know, capacity to make, make these changes. Um, community organizations can step in to, to help out. Um, yeah, um, and then I think I mentioned too, the, the bill funds a, a Department of Education position that's um, intended to support schools throughout the process um, and to ensure that the, the funds go where they're most needed. So um, yeah, looking at equity kind of at all levels of impl implementation. That's great, that's great. And, and do, I'm curious about whether the, the bill itself or the, the conversations that, that you all have had around it uh, has imagined a particular type of professional development being most useful. I mean, in some ways, it seems like maybe what, what teachers need most of all is, is time, <laughs> but I, I don't know how we, that's even harder to add <laughs> to the legislation than the money. Uh, what, what would be useful? Yeah, and I wonder too if you know you you talked about that curriculum that you developed. Like, how did you do it? What did you need? And and how could we have made it easier for you when you were when you were making it happen? Yeah, that oh blimey, sorry about that. The um, one of the things there that was I think was important was that first of all I had some background that would. Uh, help in the development and yet the hours that we spent in the, was was just enormous and I taught in a community where the teachers are given a fair amount of useful in school time for that kind of planning particularly the interdisciplinary issue um, if you have if you're bringing teachers in from the science and people teachers in from social studies or lit, uh, English uh, languages so that it was from a lot of different areas um, I think for a lot of the schools that are being addressed in this first part of the package is they don't have that flexibility. They don't have the planning time in the day that would allow them. They also don't have the background that would help. And there are there are just so many resources in the state. I was remembering, for example, it, and I can't tell you how much middle school kids love this topic. They were amazing. Uh, we even were able to do a Zoom call with the University of Maine Cold Climate Program. And they, the students had to have their questions ahead of time. They, they didn't want it to end. They didn't care about lunch. They wanted to keep going. And seeing that excitement in them because it's relevant to them is so important, but the teachers, just don't have the time in the day, and particularly so many of these communities, they know the issues, they're seeing the issues in their communities, but how do you put that program together to help the student explore the issues? This is a question, and this, it, it, you're right, it's time. It's time for the planning. It's also time fitting it into a curriculum. I used to tell our our math teacher, he didn't need as much time to teach as I did because there are only 10 numbers and they've been the same 10 numbers forever. And Euclid was so long ago, what the heck. But social studies, history and civics, every day you wake up, there's new issues. Um, but the, and the students, 
it, early on, students like things that are relevant to them. It's not that we don't teach the history, but boy, they love things that, that they can get their hands dirty on. I love that. That is, it's so, it, it's so exciting. And what a great opportunity to make something that, that otherwise feels like it's, it's sort of hanging over their heads, right? There's this horrible crisis that no one will talk about with them. It's like, well, here, we'll talk yeah. about it and we'll, we'll figure out what we can do. Um, thank you. And, and it also sounds like you really thought through the, the opportunities to build on curriculum work that, that has already been done, right? Yes. That, that you don't have to reinvent what climate change education looks like. Yes, it'll be tailored to the, the local community, but, but there's so many, we had, a, we had a lunch and learn just a couple of weeks ago with curriculum developer from, from the Smithsonian who has a whole bunch of great resources. And, exactly. and so that just, but you need the time to talk about it and the space to share what you're finding. That, that yes, makes yes. a lot of sense. Um, Anya, you talked a little bit about the, about community organizations and how they might be able to, to support professional development. And I think we actually have someone who has joined the call. Drew Dump, Dump, how am I? I'm not saying your last name right, Drew. I apologize. Thank you. This is why when we do our little walkthrough, I always make people teach me <laughs> correct pronunciation. So thanks for thanks for jumping in, Drew. Tell us, tell us what we need to know about community organizations playing a role in this. Thanks, Kathleen. And just a huge shout out to Anya and Javon. And I mean, all the youth led uh and energy from the Nebet Climate uh, Working Group has been amazing. And I've been lucky to be a part of that group from the beginning um, and to see that kind of energy. I just wish I was that articulate when I was in high school or in my 20s. So it took me 30 years to get where I am now and to be articulate. But uh, um, I think we identified early on that Maine already has an amazing network of community organizations that are already partnering with uh, public schools. And I think the COVID uh, challenges the schools with the Teach Me Outside initiative, getting kids outside was a great uh, basis for that. And, and just to speak to some of the potential of what this climate ed funding might do, for example, um, I'm at the ecology school in Saco and we just opened up a uh, carbon neutral learning center. We have uh, a dorm and dining commons um, and we're powered by 712 solar power panels. In fact, the Nebit Climate Ed, some of the seeds of this bill were uh, started on in a retreat we did here at Riverbend Farm back in July. And that ability, there's centers like the Ecology School and a great another example would be Chwonky that years ago was doing biofuel and was doing uh, hydrogen energy uh, to model for students and teachers. And really you've got a great history of amazing teacher development. For example, Wells Reserve and their estuary uh, programs for teachers in the summer, the ecology school we just had, it was actually a national uh, watershed conservation uh, uh, week long uh, teacher training for teachers actually from 17 different states. But I think I would love to see, I know there'll be individual work, but to convene teachers from around the country to spend a week or half a week at a beautiful site that's modeling and walking the talk of what a climate neutral future is, is, is really exciting. And in fact, the Ecology School hosted the amazing climate initiative uh, this past uh, summer for their high school teacher um, uh, training. So I think there's a lot of potential, and I think it's both the time and cost effective. And really, what we're finding, bringing teachers together to grapple with things like climate ed, people want to be back together. Coming out of COVID, another <laughs> webinar <laughs> probably isn't what I think we what we found from the ecology schools, our uh, uh, watershed science and conservation teacher institute. One of the best things that they, was reminding themselves that there's amazing other teachers who care about the same things they do and having that energy to evolve, take a lot of the resources that I think you've all identified that already exist for climate ed, but make it come alive. And one thing in part of my testimony to the education committee that, that I really wanted to stress was beyond 
the climate science of how it's happening, why it's happening. I think this bill can be really kickstart the idea of climate resiliency, climate adaptation, bringing in actually the potential for a green economy in Maine for local food systems, uh, whether it's solar or more local food systems, those are all addressing um, climate change positively and improving our economy um, and inspiring the fact that this is for kids. We're getting kids at an early age to want to help solve this, to be a part of it, knowing that it can be solved and then hopefully staying in Maine too after they graduate. Yeah. So, um, that's, a, so that's for... a tall, tall order and a pretty impressive, you know, what a great opportunity to, to take this and, and really just run with the opportunity and the, the excitement. Uh, almost like the, the school as a, a community hub and a, an innovation space. And kids don't know all the things that, that we all say can't be done, right? Because <laughs> We've decided they can't be done, but they haven't yet. So yeah. let's let them change the world. Yeah. Um, Kathleen, one other thing. A lot of the same folks who helped establish and get this climate ed bill have also been working on the No Child Left Inside federal legislation. And a group of us, a lot of the same people who helped move this bill into the education committee and getting Lydia Bloom to sign on as a sponsor, uh, have encouraged, we got Senator Collins to co-sponsor the No Child Left Inside bill, which is federal legislation uh, to fund environmental literacy work, which of course would also have a healthy dose of climate ed, we would have to. Uh, so it's, it hit, the bill has not been introduced yet. They're still looking for a second Republican co-sponsor, but I think that's an, another example of uh, the environmental education field in Maine really helping to promote the amazing work we're doing in our state nationally. That is just incredible. That is, thank you. Thank you for that advocacy and for that work. And, and thank all of you for, for what you're doing to, to move this forward, to raise the, the conversation and the opportunity to really improve climate education in the state. Uh, it's so exciting to hear about what's already available. And really, I, I just, go right to that piece about making sure it's accessible to teachers no matter where they are in the state of Maine uh, and making sure that, that then their students also have equitable access to that information, to those opportunities. Uh, seems like a great bill. No wonder we're all, we're all organizing for it. As we said earlier, Anya, did you want to add something? I was about to yeah, sorry. Um, no, just, just one more thing. I think, um, you know, uh, and Drew kind of hinted at this too, but, um, you know, partnering with the community organizations really gets to an intention of the bill too, to make um, the climate education that children are receiving to be, you know, location specific um, and, you know, have elements of, of outdoor learning. Um, and I, I got a question sent directly to me about like how this bill would um, you know, address, um, you know, issues in the, in climate change discussion around like socioeconomics and politics. Um, and just another quick point about the bill is that um, the intention is for it to be climate education that's, you know, interdisciplinary. So not just in the science classroom, but um, getting to, you know, what Susan was talking about with her program that, that um, she created, um, you know, at, climate education that's that's interdisciplinary um, and really gets you know students to um, think critically about about the climate crisis not only in a, a scientific um, you know lens so that's that's just a final uh, yeah top uh, detail I wanted to add I love it I love it thank you uh, thank you all for for being with us today as I said earlier, we're going to send out an, an email later this afternoon with a link to this recording, but also to the Nature Based Education Consortium's absolutely terrific set of resources and action alerts. Uh, so thank you for your advocacy. Thank you for your interest. Special thanks to Anya and Javen and Susan. You are all doing such good work and it's an honor to be to be in it with you. Uh, I hope you will all join us again next week. We'll be doing a, a deep dive into another one of the Environmental Priorities Coalition's 
priority bills this year, this one on closing the out of state waste loophole. Uh, there is an absolutely fantastic coalition working on this project. It is called Don't Waste Maine, and they've got community members and tribal citizens and all sorts of folks who have been adversely affected by the negative impacts of, of landfills and incinerators and waste disposal, and they are absolutely intent on LD1639, which would close the out-of-state waste loophole, and they'll be with us next week to, to tell us about their, their work together and how we can help. So I hope to see you all then. Grateful to all of you and hope you have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Thank you.